And our next speaker is Dr. Rachel Kironi Clark. Did I get it right? Yes, nailed it. Like, I'm feeling very dumb today. We've had a professor this morning, and now we've got a doctor who is a senior research and policy analyst at the office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor. So do you get to hang out with Jacinda? Do you see her every now and then? Do you walk past? Like, I mean, seriously, I mean, if you've been to a conference where you've met someone who knows the Prime Minister, I haven't. <clears throat> uh, her background is in medical genetics, and she finished her PhD at the Murdoch Children's Research Uni Institute and University of Melbourne. She then moved into communications role before joining the Chief Science Advisor's office, Rachel led the office's work on rethinking plastics in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2019 and supported the work on the future of commercial fishing in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2020. So you haven't done much since you've got your PhD then, just been hanging out, yeah, just talking to Jacinda. Um, she's got a broad interest in sustainability and enjoys the challenge of tackling sustainable, sustainability issues in, at the science policy interface in her current role. Without further ado, have a round of applause for Dr. Rachel. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel, I work for the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor and I'm super pleased to be here, so thank you for inviting me to your conference today. So I'll be talking to you about this project called Rethinking Plastics, which we did back in 2019. Um, and I was saying to Ewen before that we sort of move on to new projects after we've handed over the recommendations, so I'm hoping it's not too out of date <laughs> um, about a year down the track. So humans have created over 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic, and that's such a hard number to get your head around. It's the equivalent to over a billion elephants, which is also pretty impossible to get your head around. So people have made some estimates about the impacts of that plastic in the ocean, and they're estimating that at the current rate of use, there'll be more plastic than fish by weight in the ocean by 2050. And there are also other estimates that the equivalent of a truckload of plastic is dumped into the ocean uh, every 38 seconds. And sadly, there are many more alarming statistics like this. So what are we using that plastic for? Well, a group of researchers led by Gaia in 2017 did a study to look at this, and they found that about 50% of the plastic being used was made for products that only had a lifetime of about three years or less. And actually, the majority of that is for single-use products. Most of that is packaging. And so that's why, I guess, the biggest focus to date when we're trying to tackle plastics issues has really been around packaging. But at the same time, you'll see here that there are other sectors that have quite big plastic uses as well. So you can see textiles, other consumer products, and even things like building and construction. So while we're tackling packaging first in many regards, we do need to think a lot more broadly about other areas where plastics are used as well. So when we started this project back in early 2019, there are a few things that had already been done. So first of all, the uh, government had banned plastic microbeads in certain like cosmetic products and other things. And the single-use plastic shopping ban had been announced, but it hadn't actually uh, been implemented. That happened halfway through 2019. But the public's concerns over plastic were rising, and the Colmar Brunton uh, survey done at the beginning of that year actually had plastic in the environment as the number one concern for those respondents. Um, and the public are really pushing back on retailers and other businesses about their plastics use. So that was leading businesses to start signing these quite ambitious packaging declarations, uh, signing up to things like making all of their packaging reusable, recyclable or compostable by 2025. But a lot of these businesses didn't quite know how they were going to get there. There was also a program on waste underway uh, led by the government, but that sort of needed a bit more information being fed into it to be making the right decisions. And Generally, there was a global response starting to recognise the scale of the plastics problem, with a lot of people understanding uh, the problems with marine litter. But also part of the response was to something called National Sword, and that was um, the policy implemented by China where they essentially stopped taking all of the really low-value recycling and plastic waste that had previously been sent there. So countries like New Zealand and lots of other developed countries, we'd been previously sending most of our plastic waste to China and some other countries and not really dealing with it onshore. 
So all of these things were happening, but our office found that there really wasn't a good body of evidence to guide that change. So we kicked off this project called Rethinking Plastics. And what we did for that was we pulled together an expert panel to guide the work, and we had experts from a range of different areas. So someone who was an expert in microplastics, green chemistry, bioplastics, sustainable business, the psychology of sustainability, engineering, uh, marine ocean policy, and others. And so that panel really guided the work we were doing. But at the same time, we drew on the expertise of many, many more people. So we talked to people from uh, community groups, um, action groups, NGOs, small and large businesses, people in the waste industry, industry organisations, local government, central government, um, and people overseas to really understand what they saw as the biggest challenges and issues, um, try and understand the system as well as we could, and also uh, some of the actions that were already being undertaken and some solutions. So we decided on a really broad scope for this project, and a lot of people were sort of telling us the scope was too broad, but we felt that it was really hard to carve off a bit of the problem without thinking about how actually it impacts another part of the system and we really need a whole sort of uh, systems view of the plastic problem and system solution. So we looked at evidence across the whole system, but also from a range of different sources. So while it's the chief science advisor, we're not really limited to thinking about peer-reviewed academic literature. That plays a part in what we do. But we also look at evidence from... Uh, other reports and information, community groups, and even the expertise that a lot of people in the community have. And so we published this report at the end of 2019. The report had four main sort of work streams, which I'll go over the first three quite briefly today, and then dig a bit deeper into the plastics in the environment section. So the first work stream was called Changing Our Relationship with Plastics. And the whole sort of basis for this work stream was that the issue isn't necessarily plastic. It's actually a bit of a miracle material. And when it's used uh, correctly in the right applications, it makes a world of difference. If you think about uh, some of the hygiene applications when it's used in medical applications and, and other things. But how we're using it is the problem. So it's the volume, uh, the single use when it's not necessary, and it's sort of misuse and also not managing it at its end of life that's the problem. And as I said before, we decided we really needed a systems change for this. And part of what that meant was thinking about what people at all different levels can do. So while we're advising uh, the prime minister and that sort of gets fed down to central government, it's not just central government we want to be acting on this problem because they can change policies and sort of mandate things, but actually you need action at lots of different levels. So some of the things that government might do would be yeah, changing rules or trying to develop infrastructure and perhaps even leading by example by having better procurement policies and making sure they have a sustainable use of plastics. But we could also have action at lots of other levels. Like if you think about it in New Zealand, the local government sector is really where we do a lot of the waste management practices. So there's a lot of action at that level of government that can make a big difference to how we're using plastic. And then people uh, in business can make a really big difference. So brands uh, can change their packaging. Retailers can actually sort of bring in their own um, sort of rules around the types of things they'll stock. And then the waste industry played a big role. We also have, I guess, people in the community that can make a really big difference. And if you think about the single-use plastic ban in New Zealand, that really started from uh, community action in a few community groups around New Zealand, and that led to a really big groundswell and a lot of pressure on the government to make that change and sort of bring the rest of the country um, on that journey. Then the education sector has a really big play to roles, uh, role to play. Sorry, So that's both through sort of educating our rangatahi and having them inspire um, families at home, and also through the research sector. So obviously a lot of the um, research to understand the issues related with plastics, but also some of the uh, innovative solutions uh, happen at our universities and CRIs. So really it's about needing action in all those different places. And what we heard loud and clear when we were out there talking to people was that they really wanted a clear direction of travel. So people were really keen to make change, but they didn't want to start going in one direction and have the government tell them, no, we're actually going to be doing this. So it was clear that they wanted... Uh, a sense of where government policy was going to be going so that they could get on board and follow that. 
So the next work stream was all about innovation and embracing innovation to try and help these solutions while not necessarily relying on there being like an innovative new solution to fix the whole plastics problem. There are definitely roles to play for smart new ideas. So we sort of framed this uh, part of the report around the six R's, thinking that uh, there wasn't really one solution to dealing with this problem. So we can't just wipe out plastics altogether and um, refuse plastics and then use another material to replace it everywhere. Um, we really need different solutions for different contexts. So just a few examples here. Uh, a good example of just rethinking the system was thinking about coffee cups. And this again, again company and a few other ones have done it, where instead of trying to get rid of single use coffee cups and just having keep cups, they developed a system where you could kind of pay a couple of dollars, lease the cup and then bring it back next time. So it's just thinking about not just switching out the material, but maybe rethinking the whole system. And then we have an example of refusing to use plastics, which is the Atik uh, beauty bars. So they made a new product where you didn't need your shampoo and conditioner in a big plastic bottle, and instead it's a concentrated bar that comes in cardboard. Then some companies have reduced the amount of plastic they use by maybe concentrating their products or lightweighting their packaging. And so just overall, they're using less plastic, which is good. Uh, there's some cool businesses doing some reuse models, and there's Reuse is a really important part of the solution. So really thinking about ways that we don't use single-use packaging anymore. Um, Globally, I'm not sure if any of you have been to sports games or gigs or concerts where you get these cups, and rather than buying a single-use plastic cup and having a drink, you just pay a dollar as a bond and you take it back at the end. Uh, the recycling system was a bit of a shambles, and we had a whole range of recommendations about the ways that that might be improved but it's not just the um, infrastructure and technology at the end that needs work. We've got to think about the labeling of products, how consumers actually experience that, where they, uh, their plastic can be collected. Sort of the whole recycling system, there's a lot of innovations um, that could improve that system. And then an example of replacing sort of traditional plastics with new materials are these wine net clips developed by Scion um, which are biodegradable. So normally people would use these plastic net clips um, in the orchards, flick off the nets and they'll, they'll go into the environment and degrade it into microplastics. But these net clips were made from uh, bio-based materials, they're biodegradable and so they're not uh, damaging the environment if they fling off into it. So that's just a handful of examples. There's a whole lot more in the report but really the main thing we found here is that there are heaps of solutions already out there and so you kind of don't want to wait for the perfect solution that might not have any limitations because then we're all going to be in a stalemate and not make any progress. But instead, we really need to see some of these as best practice and make them standard practice across the industry. So it's all about encouraging those leading companies to sort of share and educate and support the other companies to come on board so we have best practice um, right across the board. And again, we heard from a lot of people that they wanted a long-term vision to guide that innovation and investment. And one of our recommendations was around having a fund uh, for plastics innovation so that people could sort of um, work on these ideas and also scale them up and make them context specific. And it's quite cool that the government has agreed to that. So there's now an innovations fund to support some cool plastics research. The next work stream was all about data and it was really my futile attempt at trying to track how much plastic there was in the country and sort of the material flows as it moves through New Zealand. And that was really hard because there's really, really poor data on this. Um, basically, even when we have a high level sort of tonnage of how much plastic there is, we really don't know what types what it's necessarily used for, um, it's really, really hard. And there is some high level data we managed to find. Um, just as an example, so Statistics New Zealand will publish data on what's imported into the country, but they'll only pub they've only got information about plastic resin that's imported. So that's stuff that comes in and then in New Zealand we manufacture that into a plastic product. But actually most of the stuff we use here that's plastic is imported as a finished product. So it already exists and there's no good data on what that is, which is a real problem. 
And there's sort of high-level data around how much packaging might go into the waste stream, what goes into landfill, what's recycled. But we're not that sure of its accuracy. And Sustainable Coastlines does an amazing job at the litter data. So that's a really nice example. And I think we could learn a lot from that system and using citizen science to improve our knowledge here. And Waste Mins, which is the industry organisation for waste, they did some quite good audits after we'd finished this work looking at bins around the country, just to get an idea of what people were putting into their recycling, what they're putting into their refuse, and understand the types of plastic packaging and, you know, what's contaminating the recycling stream and where we might be able to phase out certain plastics. And that's fed into some of the government's work on uh, phasing out certain plastic packaging. So I think a key point I want to make about this data is it's limited, but you don't want not having enough data to stop you taking action. Um, and I think sometimes that's what people can hide behind is saying, oh, well, we don't really know how bad the problem is because the data is poor. So there's definitely enough data to know that we need to change. But a key point would be that we really need some good audits or baseline measures just so that we can tell whether the policies that are implemented are going to make a difference. Um, so some of our recommendations really related to plugging some of those gaps might not need to be perfect at the beginning, but then implementing some more robust data collection systems so we really know, I guess, the size of the problem and if it's improving. So the last work stream, which I'll go into quite a lot more detail, was all about plastics and the environment. And we talked about life cycle assessment and beyond. And the reason we had a big focus on life cycle assessment for this work is because all materials have a cost. So when we came to looking at plastics, I think people were quite worried that we were going to say, get rid of all plastic, it's evil, it's terrible, end it. And actually, like I said before, it has some benefits, but other materials have a cost and you really need to think about all of the environmental impacts of certain materials. So a key example is that while well, glass is a lot more recyclable, it's heavier, so you use a lot more um, carbon emissions to transport it if you're doing um, big, big sort of international trips where you're sending products around. And how people measure this is a tool called life cycle assessment, and it's like a quantitative way of comparing, say, two materials or two different systems and understanding how those differ with their environmental impacts. So you can measure, like, climate change implications, uh, water use, pollution, and lots of other environmental variables, and then compare product A and product B, and then make your decision about what product you should use based on that. So it's really good because it's an evidence-based way to make that decision, rather than your gut feeling that you think a cardboard box will be better than a plastic container. Um, so we're really encouraged New Zealand businesses to apply this to their decision making um, and we had some recommendations related to that. And so in the report we use this uh, assessment to sort of guide you through a few questions that come up a lot. For example, are reusable products always better than single use alternatives? And what these assessments really tell us is that you use a lot more resource and energy to make the reusable product. So there's normally a number of times you have to use that product before it actually has a better environmental impact than the single-use product. So it's just about having an idea of, say, how many times people need to use a reusable product before it's worth, worthwhile. And another example is, should we switch to bio-based plastics? And while there's a lot of benefit to bio-based plastics, actually at the moment, some of these studies tell us that they have some other environmental impacts that perhaps the fossil-based plastics don't, such as a lot of use of pesticides and some of the crops that might feed into it. So the key study we looked at there was based in the US, and these studies are really context-specific. But it's just important to think about, you know, if you're changing this thing, what might some of the other impacts be on the environment? And then for the rest of this work stream, we looked a lot into what are the impacts of plastic on the environment that we already know about. So there's a bit of data on plastics in our oceans and it's a bit bleak and it's also really high level global estimates. So it's hard to know how accurate these are, but various uh, studies have tried to estimate basically how much plastics in the ocean, where it's coming from, how often it's getting there. So it's estimated that about 86 million tonnes of plastic is in the ocean, that, that only around 0.5% of that would be on the surface. Most of it's under the surface, and it's been found as deep as the deepest trench in the Pacific Ocean. So it's sort of everywhere. There was a study in 2010 that looked at 
how much plastic was used in these 192 coastal countries in one year. And then they estimated how much of that made its way into the ocean. So it was about 10 million tonnes out of 275 million tonnes that were used in that year made its way into the ocean. And then another study has found that probably in the ocean, about 80% of that plastics come from the land, but 20% of it's actually come from activities at sea. And a really big driver of that is commercial fishing out in the ocean. So that's quite a big uh, source of plastic in the ocean. And actually the UNEP has estimated that it's about 640,000 tonnes of fishing gear are lost every year. Um, so some of our recommendations were around working with that commercial fishing industry to try and um, change practices. You might redesign the materials or change your products or even put tracking devices so you don't lose um, fishing materials, you can retrieve them because that's a really big source of plastic into the ocean. And then another study has also found that about 90% of the plastic going into the ocean is coming from 10 large rivers that are in really densely populated parts of the world. And while that isn't New Zealand, we've got to think about the fact that we send a lot of our rubbish overseas to these countries that don't actually have really well developed waste management systems. And so we might be displacing their waste that they could manage there, and that's what's going to the rivers. So it's not really a problem for those countries that we're not influencing. And it's also a really important part of having developed countries support those developing nations to develop some waste management systems to try and stop that whole, that huge source of plastic that's going into the ocean. And just for a little bit of local data on the plastic that we're finding in our oceans rather than our coastlines, sea cleaners estimate that they remove about 160,000 litres of rubbish from the oceans around New Zealand every month. So that's quite a lot. And for just a bit more data, um, looking here at microplastics, so these are much smaller fragments of plastics of around five millimetres or smaller. It's been estimated that there's about 51 trillion microplastic particles in the oceans, which again is a number you can't really get your head around. That's about 500 times more than there are stars in our galaxy, and about 35,000 tons of that are on the surface. Um, by the way, in the report, there's the references for all of these if you want to dig in and actually um, cite these somewhere else. Um, there have been a couple of studies in New Zealand looking at microplastics in our waterways. So one study looked at 29 beaches in Auckland and found uh, there were microplastics in most of those samples. And a really big source of those microplastics was actually clothing. So all of the synthetic um, fabrics that we use, they shed fibres. Those are plastic fibres and they go through the washing machines and end up in the waterways. So there are some innovations out there that are trying to stop that at source. It might be something you add to your washing machine, um, but maybe it's about choosing natural fibres that aren't introducing plastic into our oceans. And then some other researchers have looked at whether there are microplastics in our green-lipped mussels, because that's another indicator that there's microplastics in our oceans if these mussels are taking them up. And they have found them in uh, a lot of the green-lipped mussels they've studied. So next I'll just go through some of the uh, impacts of that plastic in the environment. So this won't be news to you. We know that plastic causes physical harm to marine life and other species. And about a million seabirds, 100,000 sea mammals and marine turtles and countless fish are killed every year because of the plastic. And the effects of this are really widespread. So they affect sort of every level of the food chain and they have a negative impact on biodiversity. So they're decre this is decreasing biodiversity in the oceans. The extent of the impacts isn't really well known, but we do know that the problem is going to get worse over time as more and more plastic enters the ocean and as it breaks down further and further. And while we might be quite far away from the rest of the world and the problem's not quite as bad here, we do know it is impacting the wildlife in New Zealand and studies have found impacts on green turtles, seabirds, fish and fur seals and actually some of the fur seal entanglement rates in Kaikoura are the highest in the world. And I believe you probably learned a bit more about this this morning, but some of the additional risks from plastic actually come from the chemicals that are added to plastic while it's being manufactured. So these can disrupt the biological processes of the animal that's ingesting them. And one of the biggest concerns is that the concentration and toxicity actually get worse as you go up the food chain. And so it sort of has a worse impact every level it goes up. Researchers think that the exposure 
to the chemicals might actually be higher than what, what's being measured because as the plastics are breaking down, the microplastics have a bigger surface area for their exposure to leach out into animals. And sadly, if you can't just remove the chemical additives from the plastic we're manufacturing, because actually when the plastic's in the environment, other chemicals that are in the environment will leach onto it, and then so it sort of has the same problem. Sorry, this is all quite negative. <laughs> um, and recycled plastic and biodegradable plastic, which well, might be good solutions in other regards, they still have chemicals in them, so they're not really a solution to this problem. But we don't have a lot of data on this in New Zealand, though there was a study that looked at both Australia and New Zealand to see how, much, how, many sort of, um, how much chemical was associated with the plastic in the environment. And it was quite high in Auckland, but it was low at a far north beach that they measured. Now, regarding the impact of microplastics, we know that all ecosystems are at risk. And while we think probably the most about the marine uh, environment when we're thinking about plastics, it's also freshwater environments, terrestrial environments. Basically, they've found microplastics anywhere they've looked, um, but it can affect species of all sizes. We looked to see if there was any evidence of plastics in the edible plants that humans eat. And really, this hasn't been looked at very much. And there's sort of early evidence that there might be, but that really needs a lot more study. The plastics can be spread via wastewater. And so an important thing is whether that can get the treatment systems in the different wastewater plants can actually remove the microplastics. Because if they're not, and that gets put out back into the environment, then you're just spreading the microplastics around. And the microplastics could also escape into the environment through landfill leachate. Um, so that's when you really need uh, properly engineered and sort of modern landfills that will avoid that happening. But the researchers, the research we looked at and researchers we talked to said we don't really understand the risks from the current levels in our environment. Um, so on the one hand, the research sort of looks at higher concentrations than they actually are in the environment. But then on the flip side, we might not be measuring that amount in the environment that accurately. So there's a lot of unknowns, which is um, frustrating, and there's a lot more research needed, but it does sort of, the, the panel concluded that we really need to take a precautionary approach because we don't know enough, but the sort of indicative evidence is that it is quite uh, risky. And so we know even less about the impact of nanoplastics, and these are tiny, tiny fragments. Those microplastics keep breaking down and down. But they're so tiny that they're really hard to measure and they're really hard to treat. You can't really get them out of the environment. The concern that researchers have about this is the fragments are so small, they can actually move into organs if they're ingested. So they can have more of an impact on the biological processes um, in the cell. And they might sort of stay in the system longer than microplastics would. And again, like microplastics, they'll accumulate up the food chain. But really this area of research on nanoplastics is so new that there's very, very limited research and a lot more is needed. So another impact of plastic pollution is that it has a significant uh, biosecurity risk. So if you think about it, you've got plastic floating in the ocean and something can basically raft onto it, whether that's a bacteria um, or an invasive species and go a lot further than it could on its own, or it might be ingested by an animal that takes it um, to a different environment. And these pose a threat to biosecurity and could really have quite an impact on different ecosystems. There has been one study in New Zealand looking at this at 27 beaches in the Coromandel, and they found that the plastic debris on those beaches posed quite a high biosecurity risk. Um, another threat is relating to antimicrobial resistance, which is actually what our office is currently looking at in our new project. And this is really early evidence, but the the sort of emerging evidence suggests that the film that can um, be created on microplastics in the environment sort of supports bacteria to develop resistance to antibiotics and other antimicrobials. So it's sort of two wicked problems coming together into one even more terrifying problem. But that's really early evidence and there's a lot more research that needs to be done about that. And then when we think about human health and well-being, again, we don't know a lot about what the impact is on human health. I guess we know that there's not an acute uh, impact on human health, but it might be more around sort of long-term chronic exposure could have a problem. There has been an estimate that humans have about five, might inhale or ingest about five grams of plastic a week, which is like a credit card's worth of plastic. But again, there needs to be a lot more studies uh, done on this to understand what the sources might be and the volume. We really don't know the shorter long-term exposures 
and what the consequences would be. But we do know that we have actually found plastics in some of the local commercial fish species. But that's in the guts of fish and you don't eat the fish guts, so that's not quite as concerning. Whereas with shellfish, you sort of eat the whole animal, so if there's microplastics in there, that could be a source. So the approach to these problems is really that we need to be precautionary because basically what I was saying there was there's emerging evidence that this could be concerning, but we don't really know enough. But it's probably better to take a precautionary approach than just keep going the way we are. A key thing is focusing on prevention at source. So we know there's a lot of plastic out in the environment, in the oceans, and we really need to think about upstream solutions to address that problem. There will be a role for remediation, and it's really important in its own right, but I think for long-term systemic changes, it's about not creating the plastic in the first place if you don't need it, and then making sure that it's managed throughout its whole life cycle if it has to be used. And then really key is filling a lot of those knowledge gaps um, that I've mentioned. So addressing plastic pollution in the ocean specifically still needs to be part of a much broader systems change. So when we finished all of this work, we came up with a series of recommendations. And there are about 51 really detailed recommendations, but they sort of fell into this under the umbrella of having a national plastics action plan. And that was because we really heard that people needed that sense of direction and some clear sort of tangible steps to get there. Within that action plan, we had a series of recommendations about improving that plastics data collection, really understanding what we're using it for, what types, where we could tackle. There are a whole series of recommendations around embedding rethinking plastics in the government agenda. So that's about the government leading by example, improving their procurement policies, um, and changing other policies and even making it part of some international trade agreements. And there's a lot of work going on with sort of international policies around um, plastic waste and we're encouraging the government to get involved in those. There were a series of recommendations about creating and enabling consistency in design, use and disposal. So people are quite confused about what the different plastics are, what different packaging means, the different recycling systems in different areas throughout the country. And there really needs to be some consistency particularly so that the messaging can be clear to the public. I heard people at lunch not knowing whether the containers were going in the compostable bin or the refuse, and I was like, I don't know either. And I've worked on this for a long time, so it's really complicated, and it, I don't think it needs to be. There were a series of recommendations around innovating and amplifying, so all of those good ideas we saw there, amplify them, scale them, spread them, and come up with new and cool ideas. And then another series of recommendations around mitigating those environmental and health impacts of plastic. So starting to measure that and starting to uh, do more research to understand the risks. We don't need to do all of that in New Zealand. We can tap into a lot of overseas work and just make sure that we're getting enough information to know what's happen happening here. And we think that if all of these recommendations are implemented, success will look like having making best practice standard practice across industries, having less plastic in our environment, having reuse being the new norm. We had, we'd have a recycling system that actually works and we'd have really robust data on plastics. So since then, the government responded to the report and essentially have accepted all of the rec recommendations and I've got a lot of work underway. And a lot of it, I would say, is focused more around that trying to improve the plastics we're using at source, possibly less focused um, on the remediation, but thinking about things like phasing out some of the problematic plastics from packaging so that we're only using a few types and other types that are actually recyclable. Um, having some regulated product stewardship so that you're able to take your products back to the places that sold them to you and they have to deal with it. Having a container return scheme, so you might buy a bottle of water and then you, get, you pay your 10 cents and then you'll definitely return it back um, at the end. Standardizing some of the recycling around the country and they're really actually making sure we have that infrastructure to recycle the plastics that we're using. So ngamahi, thank you everyone for listening. And there was quite a lot of information in that talk, but there's even more on the website for our office if you're interested. And then uh, the Ministry for the Environment are really the government agency who's leading the work in the waste space. So they've got a bit of information on their website if you're interested as well. Thanks. Are you ready for some questions? I'm happy to ask. Because there's probably going to be some. There were lots of questions before. So no pressure. <laughs>
You've had your lunch, you're a bit sleepy, okay. but come on. Do we have microphone peoples? There we go. Photographer and microphonographer. And, and you've got to go right to the back, unfortunately. I'll grab the other one. Cool. Was this one over here as well? Hello? Okay. Um, so, um, this is a lot, of, a lot to take in. Um, with <laughs> engineering, it's often um, when you try to solve a problem, you create another two. Um, so, my question here is: What, where can like engineering companies or startups play a major role with? plastic reduction or recycling in the future without creating a bigger problem? That's a tough question. I guess it would be around, I don't know if life cycle assessment would definitely be the right approach, but around going through a process like that where you're you're thinking ahead to what the broader impacts are of, of those changes. So I think not just thinking about how it might impact plastics, but what sort of the flow on effects might be is probably a really important place to start and then I guess what I learned from doing this project is talking to people talking to people who have been in the industry or working on this at a community level for a long time because people hold a lot of expertise in this area but they might it might not be available sort of in the academic literature or what you're necessarily learning at the university but going out and, and talking to people about what might work what might not work what's been tried before I think is really important. So it's, a, it's like an editor of process, process basically, yeah. going back to the drawing board of the life, life cycle analysis and then trying to make sure that you're not only reducing the, the main problem, but not... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, you don't want to make two problems, but at the same time, you don't want to be paralysed about taking any action because you're worried that you're just going to create new problems. So I know it's a really hard thing to tackle, but um, I think what... A lot of the innovations that we've seen started out quite small scale, but then you've seen that they're effective in that small setting and maybe they need to be scaled up. They might need to be adapted to a different context. But, um, yeah, you might not want to change the whole infrastructure for the whole country for a chemical recycling plant, but you might try it on a small scale somewhere, see how it's working, and then move from there. Um, hi. Just um, thinking about the public response to the report, did you find it was mainly positive? Was there any negative response that you got? Um, not that I really heard about. The, we did have a really positive response. I think it was helped by um, engaging with a lot of people through the process. So we didn't kind of develop a big fat report and throw it out there and no one had talked to us along the way. And I think a lot of people knew what was what was coming and we'd taken on board a lot of ideas. Um, Possibly less talking to the general public, but more sort of people in different industries and retailers and some of the community groups. Um, we'd, we'd had a good response. Yeah, we, and I think we'd captured most people in the country. There was one group who was working on a labelling system that we hadn't managed to talk to during the project. So it's quite a small community and you kind of get... Oh, have you talked to this person? Have you talked to this person? Have you talked to this person? And eventually everyone's sort of in the same room. So there were some really good workshops run by the Sustainable Business Network around plastic packaging. And it had people from the recycling industry, people from the big uh, supermarkets, people from small businesses, and everyone was coming into the same room and talking about solutions, which was really cool. Um, sorry. Oh, am, are you giving it to no, me? No, you can hold it. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm tall, I look like a microphone stand. Okay, um, my question is, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge at a government level to become more responsible with plastics? So I guess, like, when you were doing this report, what did you think was the hardest thing in that? Yeah, I, I think some of it's probably the embedded systems and then cost like plastic is cheap and I think that's one of the problems of why it's become so pervasive and everyone uses it because it's a pretty cheap solution um, and so it's probably about changing that value set because it's not really cheap if you think about the environmental costs if it's leaked or how it's damaging the environment when you're burying it in landfill or people if it's being um, incinerated but 
probably need to think about whole of life cycle costing to support people to make better decisions and including government so that you're factoring in all of that sort of life cycle cost rather than thinking this product is cheaper than product B right now. Um, so it's probably, it would be really hard to shift that thinking, but I think there's appetite there. Um, and actually what was, what was good about this project is I think if we tried to do it 10 years earlier, people would have been less on board. But I think the kind of there's that critical mass in the public, has, everyone's reached a point where it's sort of non-negotiable that plastics are an issue and we need to do something about it. So I think that's reached government as well, which is good. Thank you. Idea. Um, after working on this report, were there any changes that you made personally to reduce your pl plastic waste? Yeah, I would say I've become a lot more conscious of my plastic waste. I didn't come into it um, probably very aware of the scale of the problem, but definitely just trying to reduce single-use plastic use overall. Um, and I think when I've spoken to a lot of people, I guess the plastic bag ban, people will argue that it hasn't made the biggest difference to plastic use overall, but it's really made people realise that it's not that hard to like remember your bags and go to the supermarket or to use a reusable alternative even when the single-use alternative might be more convenient. You can do it. So I think that for me and a lot of other people, you're like, okay, well, it's not that hard to take a reusable cup or not buy that thing or just eat something at home or whatever um, to try and avoid single-use plastics. But it's, it's also not that easy sometimes. And I think one key thing that we talked about in the report was that you don't want to put the pressure on just like the individual that you need to make all of the changes yourself because actually the system needs to work and it needs to be a system that makes it easier for you to make the right choices. So yeah, it might be a little bit less convenient, but you don't want to be like really like slogging against a system that's really making it hard for you to do the right thing. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause. Thanks.